Fora TV. The world is thinking. The book is divided into two sections, mothers and daughters. And this first um, bit that I'm going to read is from the daughters section of the book. It's from a chapter called Post-Feminist Panache, another moment of indulging in alliteration. And um, it's from a section that's called New Feminist Machismo, with a question mark. And what I do in the book throughout is situate feminism and its battles, its internal battles within popular culture and within you know, the kind of historical cultural context of what's going on. So well, the part I'm going to read you, um, and I'm going to speak louder than that train, <laughs> is from, uh, it, it takes us back to the late 1990s. Let that go. By the late 1990s, the rhetorics of feminism and individualism had combined to create a new popular icon, the feminist badass. If second wave feminism had promulgated a vision of individual women as vulnerable and sisterhood as strong, post-feminist feminism posited sisterhood as weak and celebrated instead a proud new female brawn. Images of strong, sexy bad girls permeated late 1990s popular culture. Hip hop and rap offered up new images of strong, powerful black women. The first all-female rap group, Salt and Peppa, won a Grammy for best rap performance for their single, None of Your Business, in 1995, while Missy Misdemeanor Elliott released Super Duper Fly, her first album, in 1997. Badass diva Queen Latifah joined that's so fun to say, <laughs> badass diva, Queen Latifah, joined Lisa Loeb and the Dixie Chicks at Lilith Fair, while in Hollywood, Lori Petty and Naomi Watts raised hell and tore up the desert in a comic book adaptation called Tank Girl. Hong Kong action diva Michelle Yao, meanwhile, strutted her stuff to American audiences in the latest James Bond flick, Tomorrow Never Dies. And on television, actress Sarah Michelle Gellar battled demons as the buff, kickboxing teenage demon killer known as Buffy. While off screen, thousands of women, myself included, uh, learned to kickbox at the neighborhood gym. Svelte and powerfully sexy professional athletes, daughters of Title IX, were celebrated on the covers of women's magazines as real world icons for female ambition, beauty, and strength. U.S. women won 19 gold 10 silver, and nine bronze medals at the Summer Olympics in 1996. And in 1999, the U.S. women's soccer team made headlines not only for winning the Women's World Cup, but because Brandi Chastain, y'all remember this? <laughs> you remember. After scoring the winning goal for the team, tore off her shirt. Stars who embodied the new feminist machismo spoke out, encouraging ordinary women to follow suit said comedic actress, speaking quite seriously, Roseanne Barr, the thing women have yet to learn is nobody gives you power, you just take it. In her book, Bitch, in Praise of Difficult Women, ex-rock critic bad girl Elizabeth Wurzel of Prozac Nation fame celebrated mythic and real women who flaunted their bitchiness while Madonna celebrated her own. I'm tough, I'm ambitious, and I know exactly what I want, she said. If that makes me a bitch, okay. It was a confusing moment for feminist iconography. There were sports heroines like Mia Hamm and pro-women politicians like Hillary Clinton. There was Anita Hill. There were singer-songwriters like Ani DeFranco whose songs about contemporary social issues such as racism, sexism, sexual abuse, homophobia, reproductive rights, poverty, and war gained her a passionate following among politically active college students nationwide. And then, there was Allie McBeal. The ditzy 28-year-old Ivy, Ivy League educated Boston litigator on the hit Fox television series whose face appeared along with Susan B. Anthony's, Gloria Steinem's, and Betty Friedan's on a 1998 cover of Time magazine along with the headline, does anybody remember this one? Is feminism dead? 
In t the time cover was emblematic. It synthesized what many second wavers perceived as a devolution in focus from the serious to the silly. Inside, an article by journalist Gina Belafonte ran with the juicy teaser, want to know what today's chic young feminist thinkers care about? Their bodies, themselves. Allie's particular brand of me first feminism was taken to be representative of her generation, said her creator, David Kelly. She's not a hard, strident feminist out of the 60s and 70s. She's all for women's rights, but she doesn't want to lead the charge at her own emotional expense. On one episode, as Belafonte pointed out, Allie characteristically answered the question, why are your problems so much bigger than everyone else's? With the honest response, because they're mine. Raised in solidarity, this fictionalized daughter of feminism had seemingly internalized messages about women's progress only to become hyper-individualistic. Allie's dilemmas were fiction, but Katie Royfe's were real. Katie Royfe is a figure that um, begins the chapter, and for those of you who might not know or might not remember, Katie Royfe came out in the early 90s with a book called The Morning After, Sex, Fear, and Feminism, in which she argued that um, because she and her friends hadn't been date-raped, it must not really exist and I kind of had a problem with that argument um, so uh, what did this perceived turn toward individualism mean for feminism as a movement on one level oh I should also add as context Katie Rice also in her book um, kind of blamed uh, feminism for turning women into victims so what did this perceived turn toward individualism mean for women for feminism as a movement on one level, it meant that a younger woman who had made it, like Royfi, could believe that she or her friends were somehow inv invulnerable. It meant that many women who had been able to exercise their economic, social, and other freedoms no longer necessarily saw their connection as women to women who had been unable, for reasons that were not purely psychological, to access the same. It meant, perhaps, that the critique had swung too far in the other direction, that some of those who criticized second wave feminism for harping on women's vulnerability dangerously believed that women were now invincible. The result? A feminism lacking in empathy and imagination, a brave new feminism that trafficked in selfishness, maybe, but more likely in false bravado. But perhaps the greatest irony of post-feminism 1990s style was this. In falsely imagining that we were post-patriarchy, post-feminists had in effect redefined the enemy, other feminists. In the 1970s, feminists insisted on sexual difference between men and women and launched a targeted attack on male power, domination, androcentrism, sex discrimination, and sexual double standards. But in the early 1990s, as popular feminist writers like Royfi and others turned their critical gaze on their predecessors and on each other, the emphasis on patriarchal domination and control faded into the backdrop. Personal oppression became less about suppression under patriarchy and more about, about oppression under, suppression under the sisters, meaning for members of a younger generation under the mothers. I go on in the next chapter to, to say what I think third wave feminism um, is all about, but to find that out, you're going to have to order the book. <laughs>